Okay, so today we're recording macros. We're gonna start with a blank workbook. So open up Excel and make a blank workbook. Actually, we'll make a blank workbook all by itself. So that's the easy part. Here's what I'd like to do today. I would like to be able to have an arbitrary set of tickers. So I'll come here, ticker. And I wanna be able to get the uh, price earnings ratio and the earnings per share. And I don't care what tickers they are. Let's do Southwest Airlines, uh, Google, Apple, Microsoft, ExxonMobil, American Express, GM, Ford. Okay, there's eight, that's enough. Um, even if you don't have eight, that's okay. Can you imagine that as an intern, you, know, you take an intern, I'm so excited I got an internship with Goldman Sachs or somebody, I don't know. An internship, and then you, you go there and you find out the first hour of every day your job is to go through this list of stock tickers, there's 80 of them, and to go and pull in daily information for those stocks from someplace. This information, put it into this sheet. We do this every single morning. What does that sound? Does that sound like unrealistic, an unrealistic thing to expect a, a, a uh, what, are they, what are they called? An intern to do? No. Yes. Yeah, if you're the intern, you're going, that's totally unrealistic. Why don't you write a program to do this? But why don't they write a program to do this? They don't know how. They have interns. <laughs> that's the whole reason. You know, why do we hire interns in the first place? Cheap so labor. three main reasons. Cheap labor. Two, yeah. what? Cheap labor. Oh, maybe we want to hire this person. We get like an extended interview with this person, which is kind of a big reason. But the biggest reason is all, we want to have somebody who will do the work that no ordinary person will do. <laughs> no self-respecting employee would do this. Let's hire an intern. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's sometimes it's mind-numbing. And I, the one that just absolutely amazed me. Can I tell you this? I might have mentioned this. I don't know. Absolutely amazed me. Did I tell you about the student that was an intern at Amazon? Of all the places that should be able to automatically collect data, Amazon should be able to do this. I mean, they should be able to have programs that go to all their competitors and find out what price they're charging and whatever. And they do. But for the group that this intern worked for, it was the digital camera group. You know, we're selling digital cameras. Anyone know what's really different about the pricing of digital cameras than other products? The manufacturers strongly dictate what price these cameras will sell at. And so you don't get to decide what you're going to set the price at. Nikon says, you're selling this camera, it's selling for $895.22, period. That's what it will sell for. So how do you compete? You make add-ons? Yes. You compete by what you throw in with the price. We'll throw in a tripod, and we'll throw in a bunch of SD cards, and we'll throw in a bunch of other stuff. That's where the competition is. And so this is kind of like outside the normal model of how Amazon keeps track of what their competitors are doing. So how did they, what, how did they do, what did they do to get the data? Hired an intern. That was his job. It was every morning to go into these main key competitors and find out what is it that they're offering on all these different products. He did it by hand. He was one of my former students, and so he realized this is not something he should, he should have to do. He should write a macro that would do this for him. And so he said, that was my whole first week. And Friday night, I spent almost all Friday night. I spent all day Saturday. I did stop long enough to go to church on Sunday, but only sacrament meeting. And by Monday morning, I had written a macro that would do my job for me. Uh, and so you know, he comes in Monday, and he's you know, running the macro, kind of kicking back, leaning back. The computer's kind of going crazy, collecting the data. And you know, his boss is like, what the heck is going on in here? He said, well, you know, I just uh, over the weekend wrote a uh, VBA sub procedure to collect this data automatically. You know, what do you think? Is his boss impressed? Yeah. yeah, his boss is impressed. You know why he's impressed? Because the boss had like gone to IT saying, we want to automate this. You know what they said? One year, $100,000, and we'll automate it for you. Cool. Intern did it when? The weekend. Only the weekend. Yeah, and so do you think he got a full-time offer? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Think he took it? No, I don't think he did. He went somewhere else. <laughs> I don't know why. He had lots of opportunities. So, you know, essentially, that's what we're going to be doing here today. So, the idea is that we, I don't care what the stock tickers are, I don't care how many there are. At the end of the day, we want to have a procedure, a button that you could click right here that would just say, go and pull all this data automatically. You ready to do it? Mm -hmm. Let's do it. So, let's, I'm going to start off by opening a web browser and let's go to the place that we're going to pull this data from. It's going to be from finance.yahoo.com. So we'll go to finance.yahoo.com. Right over here in the upper right hand corner, there's going to be a place to put in a stock ticker. No, maybe not that upper right hand corner. 
there should be a place to do. Oh, oh here it is, a little bit lower. And so let's go ahead and look for Southwest Airlines, L-U-V. By the way, why is Southwest Airlines ticker symbol L-U-V? Is it because they have more love at Southwest Airlines than other places? Yeah, no, no, sure. Yeah, it's not what it is, nothing to do with it at all. I always thought it was, it kind of seems like it fits their character. <laughs> What was the first air airport they flew out of? Love Field. Love Field. Field. Okay, so here is uh, data from Southwest Airlines. Now, as I look down here, here's the information I need. Pay price earnings ratio and earnings per share. Truth is, the um, earnings per share is going to be pretty stable, but the price earnings ratio is going to fluctuate with the with price. Yeah, your earnings will be pretty stable. But the price is going to fluctuate. And so this number is going to be a number that will change you know, pretty regularly. And so that's what we have to, that's what we want to be able to pull. Now, as I look at the URL here, let me zoom in on that URL just a bit. I think I'm going to zoom in on that URL just a bit. So, um, parts of the URL, first part of the protocol, HTTPS colon slash slash. That just is an agreement about how the server and the browser are going to, what rules are going to follow to communicate with each other. The next part up to the first slash gets me to the computer. It's the host that I'm after. And then everything up till the last word after the last slash is the resource on that server. Then we get to the question mark. What does the question mark mean? In the URL. Yeah, go ahead. It represents a query. Um, that's not a bad way to think of it, yeah. But, um, <laughs> and probably initially that's the very reason that it's a question mark. But what it's saying here is that everything else that comes after the question mark, they're parameters. So here we have a name, it's a name and a value. P equals love. So whenever we get to this resource that's identified before the question mark, it's going to say, okay, I'm ready to run. What does P equal? And it will look to the URL and go, oh, P equals love, and it'll know what to do. That's how, that's how it knows which docs you're going to bring up. We told it love here. Now, the thing that's interesting to me is that this says love twice. It's like twice as much love as there should be in this stuff. And so, my first question that I had to myself when I was looking at this is, do we really need this part, or could we get by without it? And so, I just said, oh, so let's just find out what happens. I mean, what's the worst that could happen if I did that? So, HTTP 404. Yeah, 404, page not found, or, you know, might be a five, some 500 level error, server error, or whatever. But I'll just give that a shot and see what it does. And the answer is, even without that other expression on the end, it does exactly, so exactly the same page. So we can work with it if it required that more complexity, but this will make our lives a little bit simpler. So this is the page that we're going to go to. And then, so here's our plan. In fact, uh, our plan is to record ourselves doing it, then to look at the code and understand it, maybe make a little few modifications to it so it will be a little more robust, or so it will work at all, period. And then uh, we'll tell it to go over and over again. How many of you are already experienced programmers in some other language? Somewhat experienced. Okay, for those of you who put your hands up, what do you do if you if you say, "Wow, there's something I want to do, but I don't know how to do it," Google. you Google it. <laughs> I'm just Google it. All right, that's what you do. In VBA, there's something else, and this will be tough. This will be tough for you guys to learn because you are so used to saying, "I'll just Google it." What's the other way to learn how to do something in VBA? Recording. You can bing it. Who said that? <laughs> you did an internship at Microsoft, didn't you? No? no? <laughs> you record a macro. You yeah, record yourself doing it. It's actually the reason that I think that VBA is a wonderful language to learn first is because anything that you know how to do in Excel, you can see how to do in code because all you have to do, turn on the recorder and do it. And it'll generate the code for you. And so that's, a, that's a, another kind of great way to be able to figure out how do I do something. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to record the macro, we'll take a look at it, and we'll, we'll get it going. Before we record it, I want to I want to prime you with some things that we're going to have to deal with in this particular macro. So I'm going to open up my code environment um, by coming to my developer tab. If you have just joined us, you probably don't have a developer tab showing. The reason the developer tab is not showing <coughs> is that they don't want my mother playing around with the developer tab. You know, they're they're scared enough to let my mother try to print something. The last thing they want to do is give her access to VBA. There is so much raw power available in VBA, they don't want mere mortals working with it. And so if you can't figure out how to get the developer tab, you don't get to play with it. But you're in luck. I'll show you again. Most of you have already done this, but if you're just joining us, it's really easy. File, options. Go to file, options. 
And then over here on the left, you have Customize Ribbon, and then you just have to put a checkbox in the Developer tab on the ribbon. So File Options, Customize Ribbon, and then Develop. So I'm just going to open up my developer environment by selecting developer and choosing Visual Basic. I'm just trying to get to the immediate window. So we'll kind of ignore or close everything else. Immediate window. If your immediate window is not showing, it's usually at the bottom of the screen, but I put it at the top so you can see better here in class. If it's not showing, choose View, Immediate Window, and then you can kind of do this along with me. We talked about string variables last time we got together. And so let me just print a string literal. Hello world. I hit print hello world, and if I execute that line, hit enter on that line in immediate window, it will just do that. It will print hello world. But now let's say I really want to say, I want to put world in quotes. In fact, even before we do that, what are these quotes here for? Why can't I just say print hello world? I think that's a variable. That's right. If I say print hello world without any quotes, the VBA interpreter is looking at this and it's going to go, it's going to go hello, hello, hello. What is hello? Is it part of my language? No, I don't see it anywhere. Is it any built-in functions? Is it some kind of variable? Is it defined somewhere? Is it some method? Is it a function? Is it an object? I can't figure out what hello is. And eventually we'd give up. But we, it, we don't want it to figure it out. It's just five letters. H-E-L-L-O. That's it. It doesn't mean anything. You're not trying to process anything. It's just these characters. And so without the quotes, the VBA interpreter looks at it and says, i got to understand this. No, you don't. You don't understand it. It's just some characters. And so that's what the quotes say. It turns this into a string literal, and it tells the interpreter, don't try to understand it. Just these characters. Put these characters. Okay. So now let's suppose that I want to put, um, put single quotes around world. No, very good. Hello world. World's in quotes because I don't really think you're the world. You're just the so-called world. But I don't like single quotes. I want double quotes. I'll change those single quotes to double quotes. You see the problem yet? Hello with the space, right? Because it runs in the first set of double quotes. Yeah, let's see what's happening here. So it says, open quote. Oh, great, bunch of characters. H-E-L-L, -L, and he thinks that. For a moment, it pauses and says, oh, I have a profane user. But then it goes, hello, oh no, that's okay. And then it gets to this quote, and what does it say? This is the end of the, this is the, ah, that's the end of the, of the string, great, hello space. And then it gets to world. And it goes, world, I don't know what world is. This is probably, I think, I was actually expecting this to give me an error here at this point. But probably just goes, this is probably just a new variable, no value. And then this is like no value either, quote, quote with no strings in it. But, but the point is, I've lost world. It's the lost world right here. You can make a movie. <laughs> so here's a trick. What the interpreter really does is it does this. It says, opening quote, start of the string, great. In the string, 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 in the string. Uh, this might be the end of the string. Let me just peek ahead and look at the very next character. Because if that very next character is a quote, it's not really the end of the string, it's just a quote inside the string. Let me get rid of the second one here. And so now it prints that, those two quotes, and it says, ah, oh, no, 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 that's just a quote inside the string. It doesn't, how many of you look at this and go, that's a really weird thing to do? Welcome to the 1970s. This is where this approach was developed in the basic language that Visual Basic inherits from. And so that's how you do a quote inside of a quote. If I want to put another quote at the end of world, what do I do? Put two more quotes right in there. Now I've got the quotes around that. We're going to have to deal with quotes inside of quotes in what we're about to do. So before we introduce the macro, which will have enough complexity of itself, I wanted to hit, kind of hit this first to prep you for what we're about to see. <laughs> okay with this? Yes. So just review. So if you do two quotes in a row within already two other quotes, it will just print the quote character. Two quotes in a row inside a quote terminated string, it just it says, oh, that's not the end of the string. It's just a quote inside the string. That's right. Now, wait a minute. I got three quotes here on the end. Okay, let's just do this. Let me take that back down to one, and let me concatenate on here a four. So that'll say, hello, world four. I'm not sure why that's interesting. But let's say I wanted to put now, just put on, let me do it without anything there. Let's just say I wanted to put on that next quote right here on the end. 
I can concatenate that on. This looks even weirder. I'll put in a couple of quotes, like this is the quotes for my string, right? Oops. So here's the quotes for my string literal. But what do I have to put on the inside of this to be able to have, make it do a quote? Two quotes, yeah. So quote, 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 quote. It's actually just one quote. Because, right, the, the quotes on the outside said so this is a string. It's got two on the inside, and so that's just really one. And so that's, I like, believe that's, that's like data compression there or something, I don't know. So this idea that we can concatenate two strings together and we'll just kind of glue them together, that's also, that's also something that we'll need to see, with here, to see here in just a minute. Questions on this? <coughs> if the question is, is it too late to drop the class? The answer is yes. I can withdraw. But you can withdraw. Uh, you can withdraw until an alarmingly late time in the semester. Did you know this? <laughs> you can withdraw until like three weeks before the class is out. Or something. As long as you're passing. That was not actually my question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, when I'm doing it on my end, and maybe I just missed the structure, when I do the double quote, hello world, it doesn't print, but if I do the triple at the end and the beginning, then it's working for me. <coughs> okay, so the question is, my, my quotes aren't quite working. I didn't quite understand everything you said, but let's just follow what it takes. Okay. Single quote here to start. Uh -huh. We're coming along. Two quotes here, which will translate into just a single quote inside the quote. Uh -huh. And then I'll go back to what I had initially, which is three quotes here at the end. So those two quotes will get translated into a single quote, a single double quote, and then, that quote ends. and then the one on the very end is the one that terminates the, the, the string literal. So it's one quotes, two quotes, three quotes. In as much as nine quotes, Yeah, in the 70s were strange. We had big hair, we had bell bottoms, and polyester. And we had quotes inside of quotes. Okay, are you ready now to go back and look at the macro? Let's go ahead and do it. So we've got our, we've got our sheet here. Uh, we know the location that we're going to go to get the data. Before we start recording, we want to ask ourselves a couple of questions. The first question is, when I'm, when I'm done recording this, I'm going to have a macro. But I want to think about, where should that, Blake? You're in two classes in one? Yes. No. Oh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, okay, so I'm going to have this macro running. And I'm going to, I, the user is going to need to be in an active cell when they start to run that macro. So I, I want to think about this. Where should the user be when they run this macro? And wherever that is, that's where I want to be when I start recording. So if we, if we think about this, if we think about using this, the macro record is going to get the price earnings ratio and the earnings per share for one stock ticker. What cell do I want to be in when I run that macro? There's more than one right answer here. Go ahead. Anywhere that you would expect to find a ticker. Yes, anywhere, on any one of these sets of ticker, because that's how, that's how we're going to have the user signal the, the ticker you want the information for, select that cell. So I'm going to be on one of these. I don't care which one. I'll start here on the left. Now, the second thing I want to ask myself is, when the macro is done running, where should it end up? What should the active cell be when we're done running? What do you think? If I start on A2, where should it end up when I'm, when I'm done running the macro? A3. Why A3? Right around again. Right around again. Run it. And run it again. And run it again. And run it again. Okay, so I've got those two things figured out. When the macro runs, where should it start? Where should it end? And then I realize where does it start? That's where I start recording. And where does it end? Make sure I end up there where I'm done recording. Okay, so I'm ready to record. To the developer tab and record macro. Should we have relative references on? Ah, do I have relative references? Let me cancel here. You don't have them on right now. That's a good question. Usually this is the first time we've ever recorded anything, and so this will be off. Let's make sure this is off. It's a little bit hard to tell if it's on or off, but when it's on, it's like a darker gray. Let's it should make sure be off. We'll, it should be off. Okay. We'll talk about relative references during while we're recording this. It's going to be important to us. So we record macro. Now, immediate, it's not recording yet. It says, okay, when I record a macro, let's give it a name. Well, in this case, let's call it, hmm, let's call it get stock data. Now, no spaces allowed. Your macro name can be letters, numbers, and the underscore character. It has to start with a letter. <coughs> oh, look at this. You can put a shortcut key. Let's see. This is get stock data, stock data. How about control S? Wait a minute. Control S sounds vaguely familiar. What does control S do? Save. Not anymore, it doesn't. Now control S runs this macro. Do you see why you don't want my mom playing with VBA? <laughs> Whenever I press control S, it prints something on the screen. That would happen. So instead of 
Control S. By the way, there are only two keystrokes that are already assigned in Excel. Like Control everything does something except for M and J. You do Control M, that'd be okay. It's a macro after all. <laughs> or we can put a capital S and like magic, this becomes Control plus Shift plus S to run this macro. I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Now, we have to decide where we're gonna store the macro. Almost every time we do this in class, we're gonna store it in this workbook. In fact, it'd probably be every time we do it. There's two other options. One, a new workbook. We would just make a new workbook. And that's where the macro would be. That was pretty boring, but this one is really interesting. Personal macro workbook. Here's the thing. I can run any macro that's in an open workbook. I've got a workbook. I could have 12 workbooks open. I'm here on workbook number one. Over here, workbook number seven. I've got a macro. Could I run that macro from workbook seven inside workbook one? Yes. I, I, I have access to any of the macros that are in any open workbook. And so the personal macro, when I put this in the personal macro workbook, what happens is the very first time I record a macro and put it in the personal macro workbook, Excel will create a workbook. It'll be called personal.xlsb. It's a binary format workbook. And it will, it'll have that macro in it. Now what's neat about the personal macro workbook is that every time I open Excel, Excel will automatically, without me thinking about it, open up the personal macro workbook and hide it. And so that will always be an open workbook. Unless I you know, go unhide it and close it. And so anytime I have a macro that I say, I don't care which workbook I have open, I want this macro to be around and available, that's where I should put it in the personal macro workbook. So the great thing about the personal macro workbook is that it opens automatically every time I open Excel without having to think about it. What's the bad thing about the personal macro workbook? It opens up every time I open Excel automatically without me thinking about it. it used to be a bigger deal. You know, if your computer is a little bit sluggish for any reason, the last thing you want is another workbook open doing stuff. And so I just it, For my use, I'm typically writing macros that go along with a workbook. And so I really don't want them in the personal macro workbook, but you may say, oh, wow, you know, I, I want something that runs every time. That's where you would put it. As soon as you do that once, it will open every time you open Excel from now until you reinstall Excel. Oh, no. That's crazy. Unless you go and find it and delete it. You can find it and delete it, but you've got to go find that file in the operating system and delete it. I'll help you with that someday if you need to, but we're going to stick with this workbook. Now a description. Get the PE ratio and EPS for the sticker in the cell. Transpositions that no extra charge. Now, <coughs> as soon as I press OK, I need to be careful because everything I do is now being recorded in Excel. Actually, even before I press OK, everything I do is being recorded in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> but now, it's being recorded in Excel, too. Be careful. I'm going to be circumspect about the things that I do. OK, so first step now is to invoke the web query. Now, folks, as we're doing this exercise, if, you, if we get to within just a hair's distance of the very next thing, and you are certain what I'm going to do, don't do it. Stick with me on this. Because um, we have different versions of Excel out there. And it's not just different versions like Excel 2016 or Excel 2013. There are different versions of Excel 2016. Because Microsoft updates Excel and pushes the changes out, and they don't all come at the same time. And so this will look different. For, based on questions I got about the homework that's due tonight, I know that some of you will have a different experience than what I'm about to show you. So, don't, even if you're sure, don't click it until I've said it's time. Data, it's time, click on data. <laughs> now, and depending on how wide your screen is, things will collapse a little bit differently out here. If your very leftmost option over here says get data, that's one thing. Now, <laughs> that's one version. How many of you have like something like get, info, get data from Access? Anyone show Microsoft Access here? So a few of you. So you've got an older version. And so hmm, for you, I'm going to have to talk you through it. Gonna, let's help those folks through first. I can't show it. I'm going to talk you through it. So I think we've got to Okay. So about a couple of inches from the left. Well, not on the big screen. The big screen's, you know, almost a foot, but 
If you have over here something that says new query, is that what it says? A button that says new query? Mm -hmm. Show query? New query, yeah. Got new query in there? Yeah, new query? Yeah. Click on new query if you've got it. Now listen, if you've got something way over here at the left that says get data, pause. Just <laughs> wait. But if right about in here you've got something that says new query that looks kind of like this, click on that. You've got some choices. What are the choices? One of them says other sources, right? About halfway down it says other sources, choose other sources. And then one of those options says from web, yes? Yes. Click that. Okay, and it should bring up a square that has a place to put a URL. Okay, so this is kind of hard. Pretend you can see this right with me and do it along with me. Questions for those folks? Okay, so now if you have your, if you have an option over here, it says get data. I don't think this is the right place. Oh, can I go this? Can I get the same way? Oh, let's do it the same way. From other sources, from web. This button is a shortcut to go to that same place if you have it. But let's just do it the same way. Get data from your very first option here. Come to from other sources and from web. So that should be very similar to what the folks did initially. And that should bring up kind of longish rectangle with a green thin border. It says a place to put a URL. I'm hopeful that it still come. We're hoping, we're waiting. Ah, there it is. I guess the border isn't green. Or is it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. Are we here? Is there anyone not here? Um, Super TA. No, I'm, I'm here. I just have a question. Just in general. No questions. Okay. Anyone not here? I'm um, yeah, open like a browser. Ah, okay. So, cancel. And Oh, you got cell phone. Can you sit back and enjoy the show. You can't do this with us. What is your question? Um, how do you feel about shortcut keys in this? Do you, do you recommend clicking on everything? Oh, what if we want to do a shortcut key? Shortcut key would be just fine. Okay, just when you're going to like the data tab and, and that and stuff. Well, whatever. Then what's going to happen? What what the interpreter is going to record is going to record the action that you invoke. I don't care how you got there. It's going to invoke the action that you. It's going to record the action that you that you're doing. The shortcut keys will be fine. Okay, so now I'm going to just go back to, I'm going to go, I've lost my, I've lost my mind standby. Here we go, okay, good. I'm going to go back to Southwest Airlines over here on finance.yahoo.com. I'm going to copy that URL. I'm going to paste it in there and say okay. Now, this may prompt you for some kind of permissions thing. If it does, just say either yes or okay. So the first time you've done this, you're going to get some kind of dialog box. <coughs> Did it come up with a dialog box? No. It's still connecting. So mine's still connecting, trying to get there. Give it a minute. And you, we should get to this point. It may take a different amount of time. Uh, I see. I guess I'm not wired. I'm on the, I'm on the wireless here, too. So pops up like this. Ah. Yeah, yeah, so if you get something that says access web content, just click connect. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's asking what credentials you want to use to be able to access this. This is the, kind of the new and updated web query wizard. It's way more powerful, not as simple <coughs> as the old one. Well, yeah, so I just have a question about running the macro recorder. Yep. If you're running the recorder and you open a new workbook, will it continue recording in that new workbook as well? Good question. So what, if I start recording a macro, and part of what I'm doing is make a new workbook, it's going to keep recording that macro in the workbook it started recording. Okay. So you can work in a secondary workbook while recording a, mac or a macro on the other one. That is correct. Yeah, in fact, if I have another workbook that's already open, I'll start recording. I can start working that work in another workbook. It'll record the fact that I activated that workbook, and it'll keep track of what I'm doing in that workbook but it will record it in the same place that I started recording the macro. You're gonna get one macro from a recording session. Is there anyone who's still waiting to get to this point? So still waiting, so while you're waiting, uh, do you have a dialog box showing? It's connecting. It's connecting. It says it's connecting, then we'll continue to wait. So you can come over here to web view, don't have to do it, you can just watch me, and it will kind of give you the sense of what the page looks like that you're on. It's not, it's not a very good browser. I mean, it's just built into Excel, there it is. But I'll come back here. 
Now, what it's done here is it says, listen, there's a couple of tables on this page. Let me just click table zero, and it'll say, oh, previous close, open, the bid ask spread, the day's range. Does this sound familiar? Previous close, open, the bid ask spread, the day's range. That's, it's found that table. It's saying, look, there's a part of this page that I could pull in just this little part. By the way, there's another one, table one. Does this one look familiar? Market cap, beta, PE ratio, EPS. Market cap, beta, PE ratio, EPS. It's this part of the page right here. And so ultimately, that's what we want to do. We want to select table one, and then we're going to say, ah, that's, we don't want the whole page. We just want that part of the page. That's what has the data that we're after. Okay, I've stalled as long as I can stall. Still waiting? You're there? Anyone still waiting? A couple of you still waiting? Well, I, you know, I haven't tap danced in a long time, but, you know, I don't know. Why, why is it the preview download on Wednesday, September 13th? What's the date? Uh, preview download. Preview downloaded on Wednesdays. Does yours say that, too? No. Does yours say that, or, or, or did you just look at mine? Couldn't you refresh yours with the top right button? Uh, yeah, you know what? It might just be going, oh, we've been here before. Oh. Uh, Wednesday, September 13th, that's about this time of last semester, oddly enough. <laughs> uh, I'm scared to refresh it, but I'm, I don't think it would record me refreshing it, but the fact that oh. we still got people waiting. Still waiting, anyone? You're still waiting? I was going to say, your earnings date is different, so it might just be cash in earnings. Yeah, I think that's what it's saying here. It's saying, hey, we're just, we, we've been to this page before. We know what this page looks like, and we're just showing this. You've got today's date? <coughs> yeah, I have today's information. It doesn't say preview oh, it download. Say the, it, it just, say the it just has yeah. the table. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's just a caching thing, a performance thing. And we'll take anything they can give us for performance because some of us are still waiting. You're good. You're there. Okay. Whew. Well, Chip, if you don't refresh it, is it just going to load this cached version of the table every time? Oh, no, it won't load this. It'll, when it comes time to actually pull the data, it'll make a new request to the page. This is just in terms of showing me you know, what data is here. Okay. So I'm ready to say load. It's now gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna record. So I'm now loading that. It's gonna take a minute for it to, to do that. It should create a new query, <coughs> put it over here. It's made a new sheet, and it should bring that data in here on the sheet. That's wonderful. So this is, it has actually created several objects here. The, the macro will now have recorded this in the lines. It says make a new query. This query is where? Is, it in the, is this on the worksheet or is it part of the workbook? Workbook. I'm not sure how you would know that. You're right, it's a part of the workbook, but I thought it would say somewhere up here. Anyway, that's a part of the workbook. So it's made this query. That's not on this sheet. It's a part of the workbook. <coughs> it's made a new sheet. And then it's made a table with the data in it that we're after. Now, I'm after the price earnings ratio. I'm just going to select that. Now, I click on B4, and it says select B4. That's what I want to do. I'm going to copy it. Press Control C. Now, I'm going to come back to sheet one, hmm, which I wish I would have named a different name, but sheet one will be fine. Now, right now, you probably think you know what we're doing. Don't do it. <laughs> what, what am I doing next? Pasting. I'm not pasting. If I paste, it's going to go right on top of A2. You're thinking move here, but if what happens if I click on B2, what's it going to do? Record it's going to record. Go to B2. Do I want to go to B2? No. Well, this time I do, but next time I don't. So I, fortunately, just like in writing a formula in VBA, I have a notion of an absolute reference versus a relative reference. Right now, it's absolute reference. I select B2. Even if I just like press, press you know, you think you're tricky. I'll just press the right arrow key, and that'll record. No, it doesn't. It records, go to B2. <laughs> you know, click on it, right arrow, whatever. So what I have to do is I have to tell it, no, 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 no. Use a relative reference. And so I'm going to come here to my developer tab, and I'm going to click on use relative references. I can turn this on and off while I'm recording. It doesn't record that I turn it on and off. It just says, okay, and that's how we're going to record. So now when I click on, it's okay to click now. Now when I click on B2, it's going to say select one cell to the right of the active cell. And you'll see that line of code that we do. Now I'm ready to paste. Now I'm ready to go back to sheet two. Hmm. Now before I click here, do I want to be on relative references or absolute references? 
Either one I think is okay at this point. You know, I'm gonna either move down one, I'm comfortable with that, or go directly to B5. So I'll just, I'm a little lazy, so I'll just leave it on relative. I'll copy, I'll go back to sheet one. I'm still on relative references. I'll go over one and paste. Am I done? What's the last thing I have to do? Go back to A3, click on Google, and now I've ended up where I want the macro to leave off, so I'm ready to stop recording. So to stop recording, back to the developer tab, and the button that used to be record is now stop recording. Very important to remember to stop recording. One day I was recording a macro, it was years ago. It was probably in the late 90s. I was recording a macro, and my wife called me at work. I don't know what she called me about, but it must have been sufficiently distressing that I forgot that I was recording a macro. Like after I hung up, I was like, okay, where was I? I don't know, I guess I was working on this worksheet. And I worked for like another four hours on one worksheet and recorded a macro that was tens of thousands of lives. It was a beautiful thing. <laughs> it wasn't useful, but it was beautiful. So it's important to remember to stop recording. Okay, so now there's a couple of warnings here. Number one, this macro created a couple of things. It created a worksheet. It created a query. We're gonna have to, we're gonna have to deal with this. In fact, if we were to record it, let's go ahead and do that. I wanna record one more thing before we look at this code. So I'm in a developer tab, record macro, do this along with me. Record macro, macro two, that's a great name. Let's leave it macro two, no shortcut key. <coughs> and I just wanted, I wanted to, to delete this workbook. I'm sorry, not the workbook, don't, don't delete the workbook. Delete the query, so I'm gonna right click it and choose delete. Are you sure you wanna delete it? I'm sure I wanna delete it. And then let's also right click sheet two and choose delete. So we deleted these two objects. It's gonna permanently delete your worksheet. Yeah, I wanna delete. Now I'll stop recording. So we've just recorded another macro called macro. Let's go look at macro two first. I wanna point out something about this. So let me come to developer tab. And kind of the easiest way to get to that macro that I, I wanna edit that macro, I'm gonna come here to macros, click on macros. That'll give me my list of all my macros. I got two of them. Get stock data and macro two. I'll select stock data, or I'll select macro two. I could run it from here. It wouldn't do much because there's nothing to delete that I tried to delete. But I will come here to edit. And that will invoke my Visual Basic Editor. And here's macro two. Go ahead and bring that up a little higher. We did two things here. What was the second thing we did? We selected sheet two and then we deleted it. So these two lines here are the lines of us deleting that worksheet. What else did we do? We deleted the query. Where's the line that deleted the query? It's not there. Why isn't it there? Because this new approach to doing web queries, that's less than a year old, when they built it, they did not build the, they didn't update the macro recorder to be able to handle recording it. The macro recorder does not know how to record deleting a query. It's like they had an intern working on the <laughs> macro recorder. I just missed it. I expect at some point, I'll do this example in class and it will be there. It will like correct it. It will be there for some of us and not for others. So it's, a, it's an error that they'll correct at some point, but that's, but that's not there. And so we're gonna have to kind of pick up the slack for Microsoft here as we're dealing with, with that one. So now let's go back and look at the code that we recorded. Question? That has an additional line of code, application.cutcopymode is false. Um, we're gonna talk about cut copy mode here in just a second. We'll see it in this code. I know exactly why that showed up there. Okay. Uh, we'll talk about it when we get to it here. Okay, so a macro, a VBA macro is a sub procedure. And so starts with the keyword sub, ends with the keyword end sub. Everything between that sub and end sub are the instructions that define what this macro is. That's a set of instructions that this macro is gonna do. We then have the name of the macro, get stock data, and then the parentheses. We'll deal with the parentheses later in life. They let us do some neat things, but for now just believe they have to be there. Now this next block right here, it's all green. It, it, these lines start with a single quote. <coughs> these are just comments, they're notes to some human. Anytime the interpreter sees a single quote like that, it just ignores the rest of the line. And so, 
is nice. Uh, this first comment, very helpful. It's nothing, it's just completely blank. I have no idea why that comment goes in there. This next one, almost as helpful. In case you missed it two lines earlier, this is the Git stock data macro. Um, you might have missed that, we wanna make that really clear. Now the next one is the note then that we typed in when we're recording it, that's handy. And then this one's also handy. When this thing was recorded, it had a keyboard shortcut, control plus shift plus S. Now we can change it afterwards and if we change it, it won't update this, but it just says when this is recorded, that's what the, that, the shortcut key was. And so the first line that we're actually executing, the first line that we actually recorded is right here. Let's see if we can understand this. Well, remember from the very first day of class, when we're dealing with this language, we have objects. Objects are things. They have properties and methods. So two characteristics of objects that we're gonna, that we're gonna live and breathe here are properties and methods. And so we'll see several of them right here. So here, active workbook, what do you think that is? Object, property, or method? Object. object. In fact, what object is it? It's whatever workbook happens to be active. It's pretty good language that way. Active workbook, then find that workbook. Now, dot queries, what do you think? Property, object, method, what do you think? It's property that also happens to be an object. How can I tell it's an object as well? Because it has properties. It's got either a property or method over here. So yeah, but let's think, what, what do you think this is? Here's the workbook. What do you think this object refers to here with the queries here? It's the collection of all the queries in the workbook. And then that object has a, has a method called add. What is this doing? What is this line doing? It's making a new query. It's saying, listen, the, this workbook has a collection of queries and we are gonna make a new one. We're adding a query to the collection of queries in the active workbook. So far so good? Now, everything else for this and the next two lines it is just giving values to this method to tell it how to run. Making a new, making a new query, we're gonna give it a name. So this name colon equals, that just says this is, this is a value that we're passing to the method so it knows what to do. It's gonna have a name of table one. Hmm, we deleted it already, but do you remember the name of it? It was called table one. That was its name. It's a very creative name. Now, this next part ends up being really, really long. It's the formula of the query. Now, in most programming languages, C, C++, C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, Pascal, and probably a bunch of others that I haven't thought of, when you make a statement and instruction for the language to figure out, you can put that on as many lines as you want. How does it know when you're done? You put a semicolon at the end. You put some character to indicate this is the end of the statement. In VBA, they said, how about this? Almost always, you put one statement per line. Let's just assume that a line goes on, a, that, a, that a statement goes on one line. And that's true probably 90, 95% of the time. Statement, maybe even more. Statement goes on one line. So on the rare occasion that you want a statement to go on to two lines, <coughs> instead of putting a semicolon after every statement, We'll just say you want to go on two lines. You just tell the interpreter this line is continuing, and that's how we do it. Underscore at the end of the line. It has to be a space before it. The underscore says, "Hey, end of the line," but the statement continues. Right? The the, the line has died, but the statement lives on. <laughs> and so, and we can see it here. Formula. This is a parameter. We're telling we're telling how to configure this query. The name is table one. The formula is this long hideous string. You know, it starts off with let, and then it has character number 13. We talked about character number 13. What's character number 13? Uh, it's like a carriage return. You know, it says, and that says, end of the line. And then a zero length string. This is awesome, a zero length string. And then character number 10, that's, a, let's see, character, <coughs> one's a carriage return, one's a line feed. I don't know which is which. There's no reason for this to be there, but that's how the recorder did it. That's fine. <laughs> and then, so we're at the next line, some spaces. So this looks pretty good when you print it out, but in looking at it in VBA, it's really ugly. But well, let me scroll over just a little bit more, and you're going to see something we've got to deal with. Do you see it? So this part, so it's, it's building up this formula. String literal, L-E-T. Then some character. Then a zero-length string. Then another character. And now the beginning of another string a bunch of spaces, source equals web page contents. What is this right here? What are you seeing? That is two double quotes. What is that? That's one quote inside the string. 
Coming along right here, another two quotes right here. That is one quote inside the string. What's this quote right here? The end of the string. It's the end of that little string literal, and then we have another character 13, character 10. It's another line return. And so we've got to look at this right here, and we've got to say, we can't leave the love there. We've got to get rid of the love. What does it need to be instead? We could use a variable here. Do you want a little exercise using a variable? Or we could just work directly right here. Let's vote. Who says variable? Who says forget the variable, let's work right here? No, oh, the right here is happening. Here's what I'm going to do. Let me, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do this kind of visually. I'm going to put a bunch of spaces in here we don't need. I am deleting three characters, L, U, V, and then I'm going to put a bunch of space in there, just so I can kind of see. I'm trying to split this string into two parts. I want to do something in the middle here. Now, right now it's still one string with a bunch of spaces in here. I want to end this string here. How do I end it? Double quote. Double quote. A single double quote. And I want to make sure that this one starts up again. What goes right here? Another quote. This looks weird. It's three quotes right in a row. What does it mean? First quote says we're starting. Next two quotes say? Well, first character here is a quote. Okay, so now I've gotten rid of the LUV. I put a single quote to kind of end <coughs> that first string literal, a single quote to start up that second string literal, and now I'm going to splice something right in here. At this point in my code, where is the stock ticker that I want to pull the information for? Where is it? Yeah. Describe to me where it is. Oh, it's in the active cell. And so I'm just going to come right here and I'm going to concatenate ampersand active cell. Now that's an object that refers to the cell. The object's got a, it's got a hundred different properties. It's got an address. It's got an interior. It's got a color, a background color. It's got a font. It's got the it's got the color of the font. It's got the italics. It's got a, it's, it's got a hundred properties. Which property do I want? It's got value. value. Whoops. Active cell dot value and percent. Let me go ahead and get rid of these other spaces so we can kind of see it all fit in here. So now. We're coming along here, we've got the string, we're ending the string. We're saying bring into this, glue on, concatenate onto this, glue on to this, whatever's the active cell's value, and then continue on with whatever else you have. This is a lot to bite off in our first example. How many of you are going, why don't we do this last time so I could have dropped the class by now? <laughs> so we've now modified this this query. So when it creates the query, it's going to create it for whichever cell, for the ticker that's in the active cell. Question. What did the ampersands on this ends in beginning and do? These right here? Yeah. So this is saying we want to glue these together They're for concatenation. Okay. We've got a string literal that starts here. Remember, inside those quotes, we're telling VBA, don't figure that out. That's for some other object to deal with. That's not for you. We're going to, we're going to pass that to some query. It's going to know how to deal with this. Then we're going to say, just like we do inside a cell, if we're making a formula, we want to concatenate something else onto it. But this, we want it to figure this out. Right? If we just plugged active cell without doing these quotes and ampersands, what would it do? Yeah, it, would, it would actually put in, in the URL, go to finance.yahoo.com, let's get a quote for active cell.value. I mean, it's looking for a stock ticker called active cell. There's no stock ticker called active cell.value. But, but now, because it's outside of those quotes, DBA is going to look at this. It's going to try to figure it out. It's going to go, what is that? Oh, it's like a range. Oh, yeah, it's the active cell on whatever she's active. That's the object you're talking about. And then it goes value. Oh, that's the file that's being displayed. And then it goes goog. It means goog. And it plugs goog right here. So it's going to go finance.yahoo.com slash quote slash goog. Uh, and that's it. Then it puts on a couple of parentheses and a comma. It's building up kind of this long formula, but that's what we have to change. So because it's outside the quotes, it figures out what it means and plugs in what it means instead of just the characters that are there. Whew. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. At the beginning, why does it have like let and then carriage return and then line feed and then all this source? Yeah, data? so this is all pretty complex. Why does it do this? And the answer is when 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 we create this. When, when the macro recorder creates this, what it's saying is it, it wants to give you this formula in a way that you could look at it. Now, it's not so concerned about what you're doing in VBA. But if you were just to go and edit this query, 
and look at the source, the formula for this query, it would say let, and then it would have a line, and then another line. Instead of being one long line, it's going to kind of format it a little bit so you can see it. And so what you're seeing here is you're seeing the formatting that it does. Uh, that's unfortunate, but you're a programmer now, and so you should be able to deal with it. Rather than just some meager data analyst who's got to look at this, just look at the source, the formula for this, and be able to modify it. And so you know they're they're saying we got to make one. Who are we going to make this look good for? The really capable people, or the folks that we're just hoping they can edit this thing without screwing it up too much. And so yeah, you get the brunt of this because they figure you're a developer. If you're looking at this, you can figure it out. And it'll be pretty comfortable for you by the end of the semester, but we're on day three. Okay. Wait. Right. Next line. Someone take a stab at what this line does. You've never seen this language before, but I think you have some intuition. Anyone? It adds a new worksheet. It says, in out of all the workbooks, we're talking about the active workbook. There's a collection of worksheets we're going to add. Does it look familiar? Active workbook, there's a collection of queries, we're adding one. That's going to add it. It's going to be the active sheet. When you add a sheet, it becomes active. And so now this next one is going to be adding that list. You don't even have to pay so much attention to it. This is building that list on that sheet. So this with to end with builds that list. And it says refresh that query. So this dot refresh down here says with this list object that we just created, we want it to refresh. Where is it looking? It's looking at table one. It's pulling this information. What's table one? Table one is the query we just created. Okay, after it refreshes, we selected B4, we copied that, we went back to sheet one, and we did an offset from the active cell. Offset zero rows in one column, that moves one column to the right, and selected. This range A1 in the middle, how I wish it didn't record this. This lets us do something really neat. It would let us offset and then select multiple cells at once. We only want to select one. The fact that it says A1 is confusing to us, it's just beginning. The truth is, we could get rid of that range A1, it would work just exactly the same. At this point, set that range A1 aside and say, just believe for me that it works okay. You can leave it there, I'm going to leave it in. You can leave it in or take it out. That lets us do something great. Let's just focus on this part from the active cell, offset a certain number of rows and columns, and then select. And then we're saying paste. And then here we have application.cut copy mode equals false. Hey, what's cut copy mode? What, what's, what's the application's cut copy mode? What's, what's going on when you're in cut copy mode? What does enter normally do when I hit enter? Uh, yeah, it commits any change to that cell and goes down. What does enter do if I'm in cut copy mode? It pastes. Yeah. I, I press control, I'm in cut copy mode. I got these little ants marching around this cell. I come here and press enter, and enter does something different. It pastes. Why does it paste? Because I'm in cut copy mode. And so after I'm done pasting, that brings me out of cut copy mode. Oh. Now, if you paste it with control V, it might not have taken you out of cut copy mode here. I pasted with enter. And that took me out of cut copy mode. So the, the truth is, you don't have to record the, the coming out of cut copy mode. If we got rid of that line, it would still work just fine. But at that point, I came out of cut copy mode. Now we got to sheet two. I selected sheet two, right? Let's see. I went to sheet one. I pasted. I came back to sheet two. I offsetted one row, zero columns. I went down a row. I copied that selection. I went back to sheet one. I offset zero rows in one column. I pasted. Then I went, I offset it down one row, backwards two columns, and selected. And that's what I did. So it went, copied the value, put it there, offset, copy, put it there. It's beautiful. Next time I create a page, what will the page of the name be? What will the name of the page, the name of the worksheet be? The next time I hit this worksheets add, what's it going to do? This time it'll be a sheet called sheet two. Next sheet time this runs, it's going to make sheet three. Sheet three. What's going to happen when we get down here to sheet two dot select? It won't find it. Yeah, that there's no sheet two. <clears throat> and so this, even though it recorded this, it's not really ready to run again. So let's do this. As soon as we add that sheet, let's give it a name that we can know what name it is. Let's call it query. Active sheet dot name equals query. 
So now we don't care what it was named when it was created, because we're going to name it query. So now everywhere in our code that we said go to sheet two, what do we have to say? <coughs> yeah, let's come over here. Everywhere it says sheet two, there should be two places. Everywhere it says sheet two, we're going to make it say query. Where's the other one? There should be two. I was on sheet two, I went to one. Oh, maybe not. I just I went to one and came back to sheet two. Okay, so it's only one place. We're going to change that to query. Now, by the way, when we're very done here at the very end, let's delete that sheet. Sheet two is also in macro two. Oh, back, we're, not, we're not using macro two. Okay. So we're good. But we're going to actually do what macro two did here. We're going to delete that sheet. But let's just do it with a simpler line. Sheets, out of all the sheets, we've got one named query, and we want to delete it. Here, this is the way the macro recorder works. You selected the sheet, and then you deleted it. We got a reference to that sheet. We called the select method. And then we said, with the selected sheet, call the delete, call the delete method. But we can just bypass that, refer to the object, and call its delete method. What happens when you delete a sheet? What, what, what really annoying dialog box pops up? Are you really sure you want to do this? Because you can't undo it. What do you think? If my code runs it, do I really want to do it? I really do want to do it. In fact, do I want my user deciding if I really want to do it? No. But unfortunately, when I hit, that, when I hit this line, it's going to put up that same dialog box. Ah. So let's do this. Let's sneak another line in here. This is, again, stuff that you don't. I don't think you might be able to record this. It'd be a hassle. There's a setting that you can set for all of Excel that just says, you know what? You know all those alerts you like to display? Forget about it. All of them. Here's how we do it. I want to get to the Excel object, the whole of Excel. We do that by this keyword application. Application. We call it application instead of Excel because we want the same language to work for Word or PowerPoint or Access. I'm referring to the whole application. Dot display alerts equals false. It's just a property. Display alerts is a property of the application object. And so by saying display alerts to false, it will suppress that box. If we had a little more time before class was out, we'd actually see that box come up and then go back and fix it. But for now, just believe me, it's going to show that as a problem and we want to turn it off. Only one more thing we have to delete. What is it? It's the query. It's the phantom that we tried to record and it didn't record. Listen, when we want to refer to the sheet, we get to the collection of sheets. And then we say, there's, a, there's one with the name query. Let's delete it. It's something similar in the, in the active workbook. There's a collection of queries. And there's a query called table one. P-A-B-O-E-1. -E what do we want to do? We want to delete it. Oh, I'm not sure if it will prompt us for that one, but let me go ahead and move that line after the display alerts. I don't think it would display alert for that one, but I'm going to go ahead and put it after just to be sure. I feel pretty good about this now, folks. Go ahead. Question? Are we worried about setting the application display alerts back to true? Are we worried about setting the display alerts back to true? Now, here's the good news. Is that in VBA, if I turn those display alerts off, it's only for VBA. And so it's not like if I don't set it back on, it'll be off. Like if I go to delete a sheet, it won't prompt me. You know, it, it will. This is only affecting what's happening through VBA. You could turn it back on at the end if you wanted to. But frankly, <coughs> I don't want any of those alerts displaying if I'm telling it what to do. Question? When we delete table one from this query, when it runs a new query, is it going to rename it to table two? The question is, good question. We had to anticipate this sheet being called sheet two and, or sheet three, and we had to play with it. Um, here, it's a little bit different because we are telling it the name that it's going to be. And so it's going to come back as table one each time. In fact, that's the reason we have to delete it, is if we tried to rename it again to table one, it'd fail. <coughs> Plus, we don't want to keep adding a new query and adding a new query. Each time we run this, we get a new query, we get you know, a list of queries as long as there are. This should do it, folks. It was kind of a lot of work to get here. And the truth of the matter is this example used to be a lot easier before Microsoft updated this query wizard. 
we should be good to go now. I should be able to come here to Google, press Control Shift S, and it should pull that data in. Look, it's already made. Table one over here is loading the data. It's pulled that data in. There's the data for Google. She, that, that other sheet is gone. Control Shift S again. It should pull the data in for Apple. The query's there. We'll see that query disappear as soon as the data gets in. And as soon as the data gets in, here we go. Now we've got the data for Apple. It's all different data, and we're ready to go. <coughs> Who's calling me? My mom? It's Bob Jackson. He can ring. <laughs> okay, listen. If I only had eight tickers to do every morning on my internship, I'd probably come in every morning and I'd press Control Shift S eight times. But what if I have 800? That would take forever. My pinky's going to get sore for pressing Control Shift S. And so, let's figure out how to make this happen over and over and over. You can't record that. What's the programming lingo for what we're about to do? We've got to create a loop. The truth is, I can put a loop around all of this data, but to make things just a little simpler to read, I'm going to make another sub-procedure. I'll write this one from scratch. I'll call this one get all data. And I'm going to make get all data do exactly the same thing that get stock data does. In fact, Get all data is just going to call get stock data. I want to call another sub procedure. I just make a statement out of that sub procedure's name. Now these two sub procedures do exactly, and I mean exactly the same thing. So we want to make a loop. We want to tell this to get stock data over and over and over. So here's how we, there's several different loops, and we've got a whole day where we talk about loops. So this is just to get us going. Do is a statement that just says, this is the beginning of the loop. Somewhere later, I'm going to have another statement that says, go back to the beginning of the loop. This is where we come back to. I could have code before the loop starts. In fact, I want some. I want to actually, whenever I run this whole thing, I want to start an A2. Listen, when I run just one, whatever stuck to Carmona is good. But if I run the whole thing, I want to start an A2. So I'll just put that range A2 dot select. So we'll start off outside the loop, go do this, and then we'll go into a loop. Get stock data. And when, we get, when we say get stock data, the interpreter is going to go, okay, get stock data. It's going to come down here and it's going to go bing, 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 bing. Oh, I'm running this code. I'm just loving it. There's so much to do here. I'm so excited. You get all the way through the end. I've done it all. I got to the end sub. Where does it go? It goes right back up to where it called it from and said, what's next? And so I'm going to say that's all. There's just one thing to do. I could have lots of lines inside the loop, but in this case it's only one. I'm going to say loop. Do you see why they call this the do loop? The do loop. What does loop say? Go back to the do. It's going to be great. Go back to the do, get stock data. The interpreter gets stock data. Fabulous. Ba, 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 runs through all these lines of code. I'm so happy running code to the end sub. I get the end sub to come back here. Loop. Loop goes back to do, get stock data. Ba, 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 ba. You know, and you, if it was you doing this, you'd be like, I can't this is so boring. The interpreter is thrilled. It's like so happy to be doing this. In fact, how long is it going to run? Forever. Well, forever is really long. It's not going to run forever. It's going to run until something really weird happens, like a power failure, or a nuclear holocaust, or a second coming, <laughs> or some error happens. We haven't given it any way to get out. So let's give it a way out. I'm going to do, I can put the, I can get the exit clause either at the top or the bottom, we'll put it at the top. Do until something is true. Do until the active cell equals stop. So when we, when, we, when we first hit this loop, it's going to A2. And then it's going to do until active cell is stopped. What's the active cell when I first get here? A2. Does A2 equal stop? No. Nope. So it's going to loop. It's going to go pull the data in. It's going to say, and then it's the active cell stop? Nope. 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 But when it gets here, if the active cell is stopped, it'll go, oh, all right. We stop. And that'll, that'll terminate the loop. Yeah. Is it case sensitive? Is it, it is case sensitive. Yeah, comparing string are, is case sensitive. Now, what's the problem with this approach I've just taken? For all I know, stop could be a ticker. Maybe there's some company that makes stop signs, and that's their ticker symbol. And so I better not do stop. Maybe I should do sto or st or just s or nothing. Quote, quote, that is exactly what an empty cell evaluates. <coughs> and so I'm going to get rid of that stop. That was just to get us to this idea that we can have a string with no characters in it. 
Last thing to do, folks, then, is just to be able to give this code a way to run it. So now this will continue to execute until we have an empty cell, and then it will drop out. Let me come back to my developer tab. I'm going to come to this little toolbox right here about halfway through. Looks like a lunch pail with a screwdriver and a wrench next to it. The very first tool is a button. I'm going to click on that tool, and then I'm going to click and drag to create a button. It will immediately say, you're making a button. I bet you want to run a macro. I do. Which one is it? Get all data. And I can put something on the name here, get data. I'll click off of it. And this is going to run until I get a blank cell. We've only got a couple of minutes, so let me go ahead and put a break in here. So it's going to run until I hit that blank cell. I'll say get data. It's pulling in the data for Southwest Airlines. Now it's pulling in the data for whatever I did next. I forgot what it was. Is it Google? Now it's pulling in the data for Apple. And then it should recognize that it's done and terminate. If I didn't have this block here, it would have kept running until it hit that one at the end. If I've got 800 of these, how long is it going to take? About 30 minutes or so. Am I going to sit here and watch it for 30 minutes? Well, if it's the first time, you'll be so proud of yourself. You'll have, you'll have a hard time taking your eyes off of it. You know, oh, it's still working. Oh, it's working again. Oh, look at that. It's still working. But after you know, doing that a couple of times, it gets old. You're going to go get a ham sandwich <laughs> while it's running. Well, how do you know when it's done? Wouldn't it be great if you could have Excel send you a text message when it's done doing that? Say, you know what? Hey, master, I'm done. What else do you have for me? <laughs> can, can we make Excel send you a text message? Oh, yeah. Will we do that in this class? Oh, yeah, not this class period because it's over. But we're going to do it before the end of the semester, actually, towards the end of the semester. So that's coming up. Thanks for coming. Class dismissed.